you all <clears throat> squeeze and rock in. Karen for the beautiful prelude music, and next week we'll have to have a cue. Tell me when to stand up. <laughs> Good morning, all of you. Um, are there announcements this morning? Andy, do you have any update on uh, Richard and Monica? Uh, she's still uh, recuperating and uh, improving. Those of you who may not know, they both right. tested positive for COVID last week, um, and they are at home. Who is that? Richard and Monica. Oh, Richard. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh. Your mom. Mm -hmm. oh, um, but uh, the last word I got about Cliff is he came home from the hospital, so that's who. That's good news. Yes, Sue. Uh, this is an unusual one, but Lily and Clarabelle asked last night if the people in the church still prayed. And I said yes, and they said that they prayed for their cat, Kathy, who was very sick. Oh. Oh. Well, I'm sorry about that. Cats are very important to people. And uh, especially the children, I think. So I hope Jazzy is okay. Any other announcements? All right, well, let's just take a moment to quiet ourselves as we prepare for our worship. <laughs> Amen. And now we'll have the lighting of the first two Advent candles. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet you. 
righteousness, and peace will kill us. Come, let us worship. Now let's lift our hearts together in our opening prayer. O Holy One, you are tender, our tender shepherd, architect of the way, beguiling hope of all who go looking for you deep in their lives, surprising us here with sweetness, challenge, vision, whatever we may need, in this moment to recognize you and follow you into the future. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Beloved. Amen. And now we'll listen to our hymn of praise, Comfort, Comfort, O My People. disasters of fires and hurricanes, exposure of societal injustices rooted in racist and sexist structures, painful political reckonings. In this moment, we are called to examine our hearts for our role in the last year, to name what traditionally have been called sins of commission. That is what we may have done to contribute to the pain and chaos of these days, and sins of omission that is what we have left undone, which contributed to the pain or failed to help alleviate suffering. So we'll take a time of silence as we reflect and make our own personal confessions to our Lord.
Comfort, comfort my people, says the God of justice and compassion. You are foreign, you are foreign, forgiven your sin and showered with grace to change your life and to work towards the kingdom of the one who is to come. New heavens and new earth, for righteousness is at home. Amen. And now we'll have the reading of our scriptures. Our first reading is taken from Isaiah 40, 1 through 11. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All the people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to the high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Second reading is taken from Psalms 85, verses 1 through 2 and 8 through 13. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may be dwelled in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. The third reading is taken from 2 Peter, chapter three, verses eight through 15. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to the repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Our 
gospel lesson this morning is taken from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Listen for the word of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May God add a blessing to this reading of God's holy word. So most of us, when we think of Advent, we think of the baby Jesus. I mean, that's what we see on our Christmas cards. I don't think I've ever seen a Christmas card with an adult Jesus on it. We drive by houses who have nativity scenes out, and we see the little baby in there. It's generally our time of Advent is about the anticipation of the birth of Christ. Thus, the picture of the baby Jesus. So it may seem a little out of place that our gospel lesson today, from Mark, begins with Jesus already as an adult. Mark completely skips over the birth narrative. It goes right into John the Baptist. And the verses that we have for today, you may or may not have noticed, doesn't even mention Jesus. Jesus is not mentioned until verse 9. So it might seem a little odd to us, because we have grown up in a culture that finds comfort this time of year in waiting for Christ's birth, and picturing that baby in the manger and all the animals and people gathered around him, looking on in awe and wonder. For with this wonderful little baby comes the miracle of hope and of our salvation. But again, in Mark's gospel, as opposed to the other two synoptic gospel, we have no birth story. Mark seems to want to get right to the heart of the matter, right to the point. Doesn't seem to need to include the unnecessary details of the birth. Because the important thing for Mark is that Jesus is here. And Mark is not one of our gospel writers that, that makes lengthy narratives. He's usually pretty much to the point. And so in today's lesson, he wants to get right to it. And he does this by drawing on the prophets of the past and proclaims a message of hope to the people of Rome. And ultimately, it continues to be a message of hope for us today. So Mark tells us, in his opening, that this is the beginning of the good news, as it's written by the prophet Isaiah. Mark proclaims Jesus, but to understand Jesus, he looks back to the scriptures of Israel, because we cannot understand our Christian faith adequately if we don't understand our Jewish roots. So often we have a disconnect to our Jewish past. And in fact, there are some pastors who don't even include the Hebrew text 
in their Sunday lessons. They ignore it, focusing only on the New Testament as if what we once called the Old Testament, more appropriately called the Hebrew Scriptures, is not an important part of our Christian past. But especially at this time of year, it is important to see the connections to the past as we ourselves look to the hope of the future. The opening words of Isaiah are announcing the good news, the gospel, to a people who have been living in exile for the past 150 years. And now God tells them, comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's land double for all her sins. The message from the prophet is a comforting word of hope that God has forgiven you your sins by grace and that God, like a shepherd, will gather his sheep in his arms and carry them in his bosom. As the people of Israel have suffered for a long time, they have lived a life of wandering and a life of wondering if God will ever forgive them of their sins and relieve them of their suffering. And finally, they are told, yes, your sins are forgiven. The voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And now if you fast forward 500 years and imagine yourself in Rome with Mark. The Gospel of Mark was written around the year 70. It was the first of the Gospels that was written. And it was written, written during a time of unrest. There was a war going on. The Emperor Nero has died a year ago. There's this order as four emperors were crowned since Nero's death and all were assassinated. And now the very general who has been attacking Jerusalem has been crowned as the new emperor. Goods are scarce. Supplies like olive oil and flour are scarce. And when they are available, the prices are sky high. Your village is a mixed bag of Jews and Gentiles. The neighborhood is broken up, broken up into small sets who distrust, distrust each other. And so tensions are high. There is no agreement as to who they should fight against. So there is no cohesiveness in the community. And there is even a small group who follow the teachings of a Jewish rabbi who lived 40 years ago and was crucified for standing up for Rome. And the Roman loyalists suspect this group of continued insurrection. And of course you know that this heretical Jewish rabbi was Jesus. This is the scene when Mark wrote his gospel. Not all that different from when Isaiah announced his good news. People of Israel had certainly gone through unthinkable hardships, but now Mark is also offering hope to the people living under the conflict of the Roman Empire. With the good news of Jesus Christ, Mark says, this is the beginning of the good news. That's what gospel means. But where does this beginning of the good news start? It starts all the way back to the beginning of the story of Israel. And Mark makes sure that we get the connection as he reminds us when he says that the prophet Isaiah foretells, see, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Mark is letting his readers know that yes, we do need to connect to our past. Our past prophets have told us what to expect. 
what God has promised to do for us. And now here is John the Baptist, who is preparing the way for Jesus. Mark is proclaiming, just like we, pro we are proclaiming during our Advent season, prepare the way and repent for the coming of the Lord. The longing of salvation that you have been hoping for, waiting for, anticipating is here. Once again, hope is offered for a suffering people. And so now we'll fast forward about 2,000 years. What kind of world are we living in? As you all know, we're living in unprecedented times with the pandemic, tough economic times, unemployment, homelessness, hunger. We've been faced with numerous natural disasters, fires, hurricanes, floods. We have political unrest, divisiveness in our country, protest about the continued racial injustice. And especially during the holiday season, many people struggle with depression and loneliness. And so many people are wondering, where is our good news? Where is our comfort? You might be saying, I know that Jesus came to save us from our sins, free us. Just how long must we wait for relief, both as a community and individually? But as we read in 2 Peter this morning, 2,000 years ago, the feelings were very much the same. In verse 4, we heard, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since our ancestors died, all things continued as they were from the beginning of creation. It seems like that, doesn't it? That things just don't seem to change, that they stay the same all the way back to Israel. Hardship after hardship after hardship. It can be very difficult to be hopeful when we're going through difficult times, especially when we are personally suffering or when people we know are suffering. When we are waiting, it seems like time just runs together, but one day is the same as the next, the same day after day after day with no relief in sight. And it doesn't help us that we live in a culture that wants things immediately. You all know with the click of a button, we can order pretty much anything we want online. And generally we can get it the next day or in the next couple of days. We can communicate with people all over the world. We can get our meals easily from drive throughs or pop it in the microwave and it's ready in just a few minutes. We want things and we want them right now. So when we wait for God's promised comfort, we want that now too. But our second Peter reading tells us to be patient, that God is patient with us and we need to be patient with God. God has given us plenty of time because God wants us all to partake in the kingdom. Not just some of us, but all of us. In verses 8 and 9 it says, But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Peter is reminding us that God's time is not our time, that God has not forgotten us. God has just given us time to get things right. 
God is hoping and waiting on us, and in turn, we anticipate Jesus' return. It reminds me of when I was a kid, and how different my reception of time was. Well, summer vacation, summer was so long, it seemed to go on forever. And the days before Christmas, well, they went on forever too, as we couldn't wait to get our presents on Christmas morning. We thought it would never come, but summer vacation always did come to an end, and Christmas morning finally always did arrive. So as we eagerly await the coming of Christ this Advent, may we take comfort in the words of the prophet. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God, remembering that God's time is not our time. But if we wait patiently and act as God's faithful and repentant people, God will say to us, it's time to wake up and receive your gift. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to teach us how to live, to show us how to love, to teach us how to be your faithful servants. We thank you, Lord, for sending us the many faithful servants, prophets, and teachers throughout history that served as examples for us, that remind us of your loving message. When we become so busy leading our own mundane lives that we forget you, we pray that we can be examples of your message and offer love and hope and a new life in Christ to all of those whom we meet. For Christ's sake. Amen. <coughs> now, as we do each week, we prepare for our gathering of pies and offering. Our offering plates are in the back, and if you are able, stone thing, if you're able, uh, we ask that you leave your offering on the way out. And struggle and enjoy God is faithful to us. We bring forth our offerings, our tithes, our treasures, our least coins, to demonstrate our faithfulness to God. <laughs>
Let us now lift our hearts together in our intercessory prayers of the people. God of power and might, comfort your people and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Faithful God, you teach us to wait for you with faithfulness and patience. Sustain and support us in our doubts and questions. Nurture our faith as we discern and enact your mission. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Loving God, you set the stars in the sky and breathe life into the earth. Renew the face of creation where it is in need of your healing touch. Mend the wounds of environmental damage and restore balance to ecosystems so that all creation can declare your praise. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Steadfast God, you never tire of seeking justice. Where people suffer from discrimination, judgment, and injustice, speak words of truth and comfort. Lead us towards a world where faithfulness will sprout underfoot and righteousness rain down from above. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Leading God, you ask us to make uneven ground smooth. Make even the disparities between your people. Sustain and support people with physical and intellectual disabilities. Accompany disability advocates who work for a world accessible to all. Teach us to celebrate the great diversity in our midst. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Tender God, you know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful in this holiday season. Comfort those who grieve. Be a companion to all who are lonely. Tend those who are sick or struggling with depression and gather all people in your healing embrace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Who else should be lifted up in prayer today? We pray for all those on our prayer list, all those who long to be here but are unable for whatever reason. We pray for all those who are sick and hungry and lonely. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give thanks for the saints who have prepared your way in the wilderness and taught us to continue their faithful work. Make their generous lives an example for all. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O oh God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I will pray as our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory of prayer. Amen. And now we'll prepare for a service of Holy Communion. And as you will remember, you'll receive your communion elements on your way out. Remembering that many of us are gathered remotely at many tables and are sharing bread and cup in a virtual communion. May we remember that this action at table is the ultimate symbol of unity. All of our tables are set, and all of God's children are welcome. Our tables are open, and all of God's children receive grace, love, and hope. This welcome, this bounty, this experience of Christ's saving love are celebrated here, at this table, and at all the tables around the world. Let us pray. 
O Savior Christ, in whose way of life lies the secret of all life and the hope of all the people, we pray for quiet courage to meet this hour. We do not choose to be born or live in such an age, but let its problems challenge us, its discoveries exhilarate us, its injustices anger us, its possibilities inspire us, and its vigor renew us for the kingdom's sake. Amen. We ask that you bless this cup and bread, that it may nourish us for the journey together in hope. So it is through the broken bread that we participate in the body of Christ. And it is through the cup of blessing that we participate in the new life that Christ brings. Through this meal, we taste and see that the Lord is good. Now let us give thanks. We thank you, loving God, that you have nourished us with this meal. We ask that it would feed our bodies, our minds, and our spirits, and give us the strength and the courage to go out into the world and serve you as your faithful disciples, today and always. Amen. And now we'll have our closing hymn in the bleak, bleak midwinter. <laughs> signs of God's future everywhere, especially in the unruly, unkempt, and persistent voices of prophets in our midst, calling for us to prepare the way in our lives and our way for the Holy One who
who is coming. Amen. May the peace of God, which does surpass all of our understanding, be with you all now and always. Amen. Oh.